Good morning, folks. Good morning. You can all uh, see the whiteboard, I hope. Okay. Uh, it's eight o'clock, so let me um, again uh, just one announcement. The final exam will be online as well, okay? And I'll put that up. I'll make an announcement on that in board as well, just to let you know. And I also realized that uh, the recorded sessions of these lectures are not available on both sections. I didn't realize that. So you will have to go to YouTube. I to upload it on YouTube, and I, you know, it took me a while to realize that. that uh, since I recorded from section one, apparently section two, when you go to recordings, you don't see it. At least that's what I'm told. Uh, I don't know, vice versa. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll make sure that you put it on YouTube so that you have access to it as well. Okay. Uh, so, also a reminder: you have an exam on Saturday. Okay, which will cover uh, the last part of chapter 13, which is activation energies as well as reaction mechanisms and uh, whatever we do in chapter 14 between today and Thursday. Okay, and I'll tell you on Thursday exactly where we will stop. I would like to finish chapter 14 by next Tuesday so that we can go on to 15 and 16 acids and bases and so forth. Okay. So just be aware of that. Okay, so we were discussing equilibrium constants and uh, an equilibrium constant, well, so what does an equilibrium mean? An equilibrium means that you have both forward and reverse reaction occurring. It's always indicated by a double-sided arrow. So let's say in this particular case, we're looking at this reaction, CO plus 2H2 gives you CO, gives you CH3OH, right? So in this case, if you're looking at the reactant concentration, if you're looking at the carbon monoxide concentration, that carbon monoxide and hydrogen concentration is going to decrease as a function of time, whereas the methanol, which is the product, is going to increase as a function of time. Equilibrium is attained when the concentrations are not changing anymore. That's the equilibrium part. So this region right here, where the concentrations do not change, is what is reflected in the equilibrium. So how do you write an equilibrium constant expression? The equilibrium constant expression is the products of the reactants, right? But the products got to uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, way you write the concentrations depends on what the stoichiometric coefficient is. So in this case, the product is CH3OH. That's the numerator in the in the equilibrium constant expression. Right. The denominator is the reactants. The reactants in this case is CO right, and H2. But H2 in this case is a stoichiometric coefficient of 2, so this would be square. Okay. This would be square. So the equilibrium constant expression for any reaction, so if I have 2A plus 3B equals 2C, right, the equilibrium constant expression is going to be the products. So the concentration of C, since the stoichiometric coefficient is 2, it will be 2, right, squared, divided by the concentration of A squared times the concentration of B cubed. And this equilibrium constant value will is a constant. That's what it means, okay? It's a constant. So it doesn't matter what your concentrations, how you reach that equilibrium. It doesn't matter what you begin with in terms of concentrations. If what matters is the final equilibrium concentrations and where how you reach there doesn't really matter, okay? So it is the concentrations at this point in time when the system has attained equilibrium, when the reaction has attained the equilibrium, that is what you're interested in. So in this case, what you're asked to do, this is the practice exercise, for example, given to you on page 702 of your textbook, okay? Page 702 of your textbook, the practice exercise, it's asking you to calculate the equilibrium constant. And this is the important word here. It says that at equilibrium, these are the concentrations of hydrogen, CO, and CH3OH. 
So given those values, you want to calculate what the equilibrium constant is. The value of the equilibrium constant then is equal to, in this case, the concentration at equilibrium. Now, the implication is here that this is all calculated at equilibrium, okay? And I sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, this is not written, okay? But that's what the implication is. That's always understood, implicitly understood, that these concentrations that when you apply it to an equilibrium constant, is at equilibrium that is in this region of the curve in this region of the time concentration curve okay so in this case this is going to be 0 0.040 divided by the concentration of co in this case is 0 0.025 times 0 0.074 okay so you can work this out i didn't bring my calculator with me but uh, you can work it out and tell me what the value of the equilibrium constant is going to be uh, okay, now the equilibrium constant, okay, the equilibrium constant by convention does not have a unit associated with it. You might say, how is that possible that this is molarity in the numerator, this is molarity in the denominator times molarity squared, so this should have a unit of molarity, uh, so this is molarity divided by molarity to the power of three, and you're going to say that this should have a unit of molarity to the power of minus two. But by convention, by convention, we have uh, the, the convention is that equilibrium constants don't have a unit associated with it. Okay, equilibrium constants don't have a unit associated with it. So, and the equilibrium constant is temperature. So we will assume that during the course of this reaction, the temperature does not change. And I think in this particular in this particular problem, the equilibrium constant is 700 Kelvin. Okay. I think it's 700 Kelvin. I can't remember what the value is. Yes, it's at 700 Kelvin. Okay. So, <clears throat> and we'll worry about the dependence of equilibrium constants and temperature later on. We are not going to be at this point uh, quite concerned about it. Okay. But what we're interested in is in this value of the equilibrium constant. Okay. So the value of the equilibrium constant, and um, you know maybe I should have, I should have. Uh, um, brought my calculator here, but I forgot. So let me see if I can do this. I got 21.6. How much? I got 21.6. OK, 21.6. OK, let me write that out. So the value of the equilibrium constant is, uh, <laughs> um, OK, and the value of the equilibrium constant is 21.6. OK, now you can get to 21.6 by any Increase this, decrease this, you can decrease this, decrease this. You can do it by any method. So how you attain that equilibrium constant is a matter of your choice of how you do it, okay? Now, what does the value of the equilibrium constant be? The value of the equilibrium constant tells you a lot about what the type of reaction is. A value of equilibrium constant, so think about it. If the numerator is less than the denominator, okay? The numerator is less than the denominator. That means there's less products as compared to reactants, right? So a value of equilibrium constant less than one, okay? A value of equilibrium constant less than one will mean that the reaction is favored in the reverse direction, right? That is, not much products is formed. So uh, let's do some problems on this in that way. It becomes clearer to you as to what I'm talking about. So just give me a second while I find a problem, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So <clears throat> Oh, God. Okay, so here is an example. So let me erase this, okay? Here is an example of an equilibrium constant that is very, very small. So here you have a reaction, and the reaction is uh, 2 NOBr gas, 2 NOBr gas, 2 NOBr gas, nitric oxide, nitro, whatever it is, NOBr gas, giving you in this case, uh, 2NO plus Br2. This gives you 2NO gas plus Br2, okay? 2NO gas 
plus Br2 gas. And the value of this equilibrium constant for this particular reaction, the value of the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction is three times 10 to the power minus four, okay? Three times 10 to the power minus four. In other words, this is 0 0.0003, right? That's the value of the equilibrium constant. So what that means is that you're not getting much of this product, okay? So a value of the equilibrium constant less than one means that the reaction is more favored in the reverse direction. A value of equilibrium constant that is equal to one means that it's balanced, that is both forward and reverse reactions can occur equally well. A value of equilibrium constant that is greater than one means that the reaction is favored in the forward direction. The example is the one that we just did in terms of the CO plus 2H2 giving you C, CO plus 2H2 giving you CH3OH, which you calculated to be K is equal to 21.6, right? This is a value greater than one. That is, in other words, the numerator is greater than the, the numerator is greater than the denominator, and therefore the equilibrium constant is going to be in this forward direction. You can have equilibrium constants that are 1, 100, 1,000, 10,000, whatever it is, okay? And you can have equilibrium constants, as you see here, that are very, very small. That means that the likelihood of the forward reaction occurring, all that means is that the likelihood of the forward reaction occurring is very small, okay? It's very, very small. So what we are also interested at this point is in manipulating equilibrium constant expressions, okay? In manipulating equilibrium constant expressions. So here is another example, and let me do this. This is in problem number 17, uh, slide number 17 on the equilibrium chapter and the equilibrium chapter 14, part one, okay? Slide number 14 in equilibrium chapter part one. So in this case, uh, another problem, very similar to the what, what we did, N2 plus 3H2 gives you 2NH3, right? N2 plus 3H2 gives you 2NH3. And again, you give the equilibrium concentrations. Now, unless otherwise specified, so sometimes it might tell you that, the, that it's the initial concentration, and obviously, that concentration does not mean equilibrium. Initial concentration means the concentration at time t equals zero, okay? So that's not equilibrium. But in this case, they don't tell you this, but it's understood that this is an equilibrium. So nitrogen is equal to 0.921 molar, okay? The hydrogen concentration is equal to 0.763 molar. The hydrogen concentration is 0.763 molar. And the ammonia concentration is 0.157 molar. 0.157 molar. Okay. So in this case, you're asked to calculate the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant K is equal to the concentration of ammonia, the equilibrium concentration of ammonia squared divided by squared. Why? Because the stoichiometric coefficient is two. The concentration of the reactants is nitrogen. The concentration of the hydrogen in this case is going to be cubed because of the stoichiometric coefficient 3. So in this case now, this is going to be 0.157 squared divided by um, the, 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 the 0.921 times hydrogen is 0 0.763 to the power 3. And you're asked to calculate this. So uh, you can calculate it, but I think it's given to you. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't give you the value here. So you have to figure this out. Okay. Uh, 0 0.157 squared, 0 0.921 divided by uh, times 0 0.763. Okay, cubed. But these are simple exercises. These are very simple exercises that are based on uh, very simple exercises that are based on. I can't find my. The cap on this pen. What did I do? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, you have to. So, okay. So, uh, so these are simple exercises, but the important thing is you have to realize that these are equilibrium concentrations. 
and you can only apply equilibrium concentrations in the equilibrium constant, okay? You can only apply equilibrium constants in the equilibrium concentration. Equilibrium concentrations in the equilibrium constant, okay? Sometimes I don't know what I'm saying, okay? So, <clears throat> and if you go back to slide 13, if you go back to slide 13 in that part one, the, it tells a value, uh, the value of K gives you a lot in terms of the extent of reaction, okay? The value of K in this case, for example, and there's an example that is given to you, 2H2 plus O2, 2H2 plus O2 gives you 2H2O, right? The value of this reaction is K is equal to, the value of the equilibrium constant is 3 times 10 to the power 81, okay? 3 times 10 to the power 81. That means that the forward reaction is very, very much for, uh, a favorite, okay? Now, having said this, okay, one is not saying anything about the rate of the reaction. This means that in terms the equilibrium constant is high, but it's not telling you what the speed of the reaction is, okay? It does not tell you what the speed of the reaction is, okay? That's not the case. It only tells you that, yes, the products are favored, Right? Nothing else. Nothing beyond that. So don't read too much into what the value of the equilibrium constant is. Okay? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is start manipulating equilibrium constants. Okay? We're going to start manipulating equilibrium constants. What do I mean by manipulating equilibrium constants? Suppose you have an equilibrium constant for two reactions. You can calculate the equilibrium constant of the third by just simply adding up the two reactions. That's what we're going to do. And it's a very similar application, sort of like SS law, okay? And so now what we're going to do is turn our attention to uh, the slides in part two, the slides in part two of chapter 14. That's what we're going to do. So the slides in part two of chapter 14, okay? Uh, so let me actually uh, step back a little, okay? So if I go and, and talk about gases, I, I realize that that's the first thing on this part too that I need to cover. Okay? So what about what happens in the case of gases? So so far, what we've done is we've calculated equilibrium constants using molarities. Okay, using molarities. So we've calculated Kc. This is an equilibrium constant calculated in terms of concentrations, and hence the P subscript C. Okay. So this is an equilibrium constant that is measured, that is determined, that uh, uses concentrations, okay, uses concentrations. And in this case, it's the concentration is always molarity, okay? You're using molarity concentrations to calculate the equilibrium constants. But having said that, what's important is this. Having said that, what's important is this, is that the, uh, the, uh, Equilibrium constant now in a gas reaction. So, for example, in a reaction that involves a gas, and an example of this would be there are lots of examples of reactions in the gas phase. The reactions in the gas phase, for example, would be let's say I take an example like this 4NH3, uh, which is your slide number three on that 4NH3 gas plus 7O2 gas gives you. Um, 4NO2 gas, 4NO2 gas plus uh, 6H2O gas. So in this case, all the products and reactants are in the gas phase, okay? So instead of using concentration units, maybe, maybe it's better to use units that are related to the pressure of the gas. It makes life much easier, okay? Concentrations, it's its not difficult to calculate concentrations of a gas uh, in a particular reaction, but it's easier to monitor the pressure of the reactants and then see what the, uh, to monitor the pressure of the gases and then be able to use the equilibrium constant in that expression. So let me write down a generic example of this. So a generic example is you have A gas plus 2B gas. Well, let me a simpler example. The simpler example would be N2 plus 3H2F, and, and I need to write down the, the phase of the material. This is nitrogen gas plus 
three hydrogen gas gives you moles of hydrogen, gives you two moles of ammonia, gives you two moles of ammonia gas. Okay. So what I want to do is to be able to write down the equilibrium constant, but the equilibrium constant expression that I want to write down must be an expression that is in terms of the pressure of the gases. So what we do is we use partial pressures. We use partial pressures. I don't know if you remember this, but you probably saw partial pressures in Chem 1100. Okay. So in this case, what we refer to is, so here is your container. Okay. Here is your container. And in this container, you have nitrogen and hydrogen and ammonia, right? And you're carrying out this reaction. So the partial pressure of the nitrogen, the partial pressure of the nitrogen, so in this case, the partial pressure of the nitrogen, and you can use any unit of pressure that you wish. You can use the unit of pressure in atmospheres. You can use a unit of pressure in millimeters of mercury. You can use a unit of pressure in terms of uh, uh, preferably atmospheres. And we'll show you why you want to use atmospheres, but it's preferred to use the partial pressures to, to use pressure units of atmospheres when you calculate equilibrium constants in terms of pressure, okay? So what this means is, let's say I have three different, so in this case I have nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia, right? So let's say that the nitrogen is, is these black circles, okay, with the, uh, the black hollow circles, okay? The hydrogen in this case is, the hydrogen in this case is, uh, yellow, I mean the blue circles, okay, blue yellow, uh, the blue hollow circles, okay, and we can have ammonia as well, we can have ammonia as well, and the ammonia is going to be, in this case, let me uh, use the ammonia, the ammonia is going to be uh, <coughs> these, okay, orange ones, I hope you can see, okay, so all of them is in this, so how would you calculate the partial pressure of the, uh, of the nitrogen? The partial pressure of the nitrogen is the only thing that you want to involve is this, okay? So in this case, when you remove all of the others and in that same volume, you only have the nitrogen, that's the partial pressure of the nitrogen. You can do the same thing for the partial pressure of the hydrogen. You can do the same thing for the partial pressure of ammonia. In other words, it's, it's the pressure exerted by that component alone in that particular, in that same volume. So if I do that, then the Kp, the partial, the, the equilibrium constant expression in terms of pressures is going to be equal to the same exact idea as in concentrations, okay? Except that now instead of concentrations, what we're going to do is talk about the partial pressure. So this is the partial pressure of ammonia squared, Right? In, the, in the numerator, in the denominator, what do you have? The reactant. So this is the partial pressure of nitrogen, right? This is the partial pressure of nitrogen, and this is the partial pressure of hydrogen. Again, the stoichiometric coefficient is 3, so this is partial pressure of hydrogen raised to the power of 3. So in terms of concentrations, this is exactly the same uh, approach. In terms of concentrations, I would have this as Kc is equal to the concentration of ammonia squared divided by the concentration of nitrogen times the concentration of hydrogen to the power of 3. So notice the similarity between the two. The only difference is that you are, well, the big difference is that you're using concentration here and here you're using partial pressure. And we also I mean, we distinguish it by saying that this is an equilibrium constant calculated as a function of concentrations, and this is Kc. This is an equilibrium constant that is determined as a function of pressure, so that's called Kp. Now, how are Kc and Kp related? Kc is not equal to Kp, okay? You have to determine the relationship between Kc and Kp. Okay, you have to determine the relationship between Kc and P. It's not obvious what that relationship is, but you know enough about the gas laws to be able to write down what that relationship is. And that's what's given to you on slide one in chapter 14. What is the relationship between pressure and concentration? Well, you, you know that, and how do you know that? You 
look at, uh, uh, you can use the ideal gas law. What's the ideal gas law? P is equal to nRT, right? P is equal to, I'm sorry, P times V is equal to nRT, as we just forget. Okay, PV is equal to nRT. So in this case now, what I can do is, I can simply rearrange this equation to give me the pressure is equal to N divided by V. Now let's count and let's make sure that we know everything of what this means. N is the number of moles of the gas. R is the gas constant. T is the temperature in Kelvin. V is the volume usually in liters. And P is the pressure usually in atmospheres. Why do we use liter at why do we use this in atmospheres and V in liters? Why? Because R, that we typically use the value of R is 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole per degree Kelvin. So given the fact that R is in liter atmospheres units, it's always advisable to use pressure in atmospheres and the volume in liters. So now when I look at this equation, right, now when I look at this equation, I can rearrange that equation to give me, I can rearrange that equation to give me P is equal to, and I bring the volume over to the denominator on this side, N over V times RT, right? What is N over V? The number of moles divided by the volume in liters, right? N over V divided by the volume in liters. So moles divided by the volume in liters. Well, what is that? The volume in liters is, and the moles divided by the volume in liters is simply molarity. Right? So the pressure is equal to the concentration times RT, whatever the concentration is of that component times RT. So you can easily go back and forth between partial pressures and react uh, partial pressures and concentrations. And if you want to do that, there's a very simple relationship between them. the relationship between KP and KC. The relationship between Kp and Kc is equal to, Kp is equal to Kc times Rt. Where R is equal to 0 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole per degree Kelvin. T is the temperature in Kelvin. Rt to the power delta N. The only thing that I need to tell you is what is delta N. What is delta N? Delta N is the difference between the number of product moles, the number of mole, uh, the number of gas moles of product, number of gas moles of product, whatever the product is, minus the number of gas moles of reactant. And let me erase this down, minus the number of gas moles of reactant, number of gas moles of product, minus the number of gas moles of reactant. And I will do an example of this to tell you what that value is, okay? I'll do an example. So, let's take this example, N2 plus 3H2 gives you 2NH3. What is the value of delta N in this case? What is the value of delta N in this case? The value of delta N in this case is the product gas moles. What are the product moles and gases? There's two moles of ammonia, right? So this is going to be two minus, right? The number of reactant gas moles. The number of reactant gas moles is one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen, right? So that's four. So two minus four. So delta N is equal to minus two. Delta N is equal to minus two. So for this particular reaction, Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power minus 2, okay? Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power minus 2. Let's do another example. Let's do this one right here, okay? Let's do this one right here. So here in this case, the calculation is going to be very simple. I want to calculate the relationship between Kp and Kc, right? Using this equation, Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power delta n. So what is delta n in this case? Delta n in this case is equal to the number of product moles. The product, and you only count gas moles. You don't count anything else. So these designations mean a lot. 
okay? These designations are very, very important in understanding what's going on. So, um, so in this case, this is six moles of H2O gas, not H2O liquid, H2O gas. Four moles of NO2 gas, so the total number of moles on our side is 10, right? The total number of moles on the reactant side, there are seven moles of oxygen and four moles of ammonia. So in this case, it's 10 minus 11. So this gives me minus one. So the relationship in this case, Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power minus one. So it very much, the, the exact nature of the relationship depends on what the number of gas moles are on the product and the reactant side, okay? The general equation is Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power of delta M. Delta M, as I said, is the number of product gas moles minus the number of reactant gas moles, okay? So let's do a few more problems in this case, okay? Let's do a few more problems and... Um, Let's check. Okay. So let's do uh, problem number six. Problem number six. I'm sorry, no, slide number six in, in that part two, not problem number six. Slide number six uh, in. Uh, in uh, Slide number six in part two of the chapter 14, okay? So in this case, you're given the reaction PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride gas, gives you PCL3 gas plus phosphorus trichloride gas plus Cl2 gas, okay? Plus Cl2 gas, okay? So in this case, you are given the value of Kc. You're given the value of Kc, which is equal to 4.00 at 25 degrees Celsius. 25 degrees Celsius. Useful to remember that 25 degrees Celsius is equal to 298 Kelvin. 298 Kelvin, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. This is given to you as 425 degrees Celsius. I can't read. Uh, I'm getting blind in my old age. This is 425 Celsius, okay? I'm sorry, I read it as 25 degrees Celsius. So 425 plus 273 is 698 Kelvin, okay? This is 698 Just be aware of that, okay? 698 Kelvin. Why do I need 698 Kelvin? Because Kp is equal to, what you're asked to do is to calculate Kp. That's what you're asked to calculate, okay? So Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power delta N. So we have to calculate what delta N is. Delta N is what? The number of product gas moles minus the number of reactant gas moles. There are two product gas moles in this case, right? So two is, so this delta N is going to be equal to two, one plus one, two, minus, there's only one reactant gas mole, so two minus one is one. So that means that Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the power of one, so just simply Rt. So Kc is given as 4.00, right? 4.00. And RT, we have to calculate what RT is. 0 0.082 liter atmospheres per mole per degree Kelvin, right? Liter atmospheres per mole per degree Kelvin times the temperature. The temperature is, uh, the, 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 what's the temperature? 698, 698 Kelvin, okay? So Kelvin, Kelvin cancels, and what you are left with is simply, uh, in terms of atmospheres, the liters moles also cancel, okay? The units don't need to be worried. The, uh, remember, equilibrium constants are unitless. So if you multiply 4 times 0 0.082 times 2, 9, 698, I don't know what the answer is, but 
I think I've given it here in slide seven, I believe. Uh, uh, no, in slide eight. I don't know why this makes it so complicated. The uh, KP is equal to 229. KP is equal to 229. Okay. You can verify when you add these, when you multiply this out, if that's correct. Okay. It should be. Okay. I think so. Okay. <clears throat> so, so you need to be able to convert equilibrium constants calculated with concentrations into equilibrium constants calculated in units of pressure, and vice versa too. Okay. You need to be able to go back from KP to KC and KC to KP. Okay. I expect you to be able to do that easily enough. Okay. I expect you to be able to do that easily enough. Okay. So, um, now, what we're going to do is, we're also going to look at equilibrium constants, manipulating the equilibrium constants, where, when you, what happens when you uh, change the reaction. So, for example, you have an equilibrium constant for a reaction going like this. An equilibrium constant is always is always calculated for the reaction as it is written. So when I write this in this particular fashion, where A plus B goes to C, right, then the equilibrium constant is going to be the concentration of C divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of B, right? But now, if I bust this reaction and I go from C goes to A plus B, Right? C goes to A plus B. In this case, the equilibrium constant, in this case, and I'm just going to call this K prime, just to distinguish, K prime is equal to the concentration of A times the concentration of B divided by the concentration of C. So how is K and K prime related? A is simply 1 over K prime. A is simply equal to 1 over K prime, or K prime is equal to 1 over K. So, for, so remember, equilibrium constant is always written, is always, the expression is always for the reaction as it is written. If you choose to reverse this reaction, then the equilibrium constant that you get will be exactly 1 over that, okay? So you have to be careful as to how you write the reaction. How you write the reaction becomes important, okay? So, uh, the example that is given to you on slide 10 is 2NO2 gives you N2O4. 2NO2 gives you N2O4. By the way, this is all in gas. I'm being careless, but these are all gases. So KC, the equilibrium constant for the forward reaction, is going to be N2O4 divided by NO2 squared, right? N2O4, concentration of N2O4 divided by the concentration of NO2 squared. If I reverse this reaction, and I wrote this reaction as N2O4 gives me 2NO2, this would be the equilibrium constant here, and I'll just call it K prime in this case, is going to be NO2 squared divided by the N2O4 concentration. And how are the two related? This is simply the inverse of the other one, okay? K forward is equal to K reverse, 1 over K reverse, okay? So, having said that, let's uh, look at a little more examples of, of uh, reactions, okay? So, let's take another example. So, let's say in this case, I take the same reaction, 2NO2 gives you N2O4, right? 2NO2 gas gives you N2O4 gas. Sorry, N2O4. N2. Two of four gas, right? I'm just going to multiply this reaction by two. I'm going to multiply this reaction by two. If I multiply this reaction by two, what do I get? I get 4NO2, right? 4NO2 gas. So this is multiplied by two. 4NO2 gas gives me 2N2O4 gas. The equilibrium constant for this reaction is this, right? 
The equilibrium constant for this reaction is what? And I'll call it again K prime is equal to N2O4, the concentration of the products, but in this case, since the stoichiometric coefficient is 2, it's squared, divided by the concentration of NO2 raised to the power 4, right? So, how are the two related? Well, you multiplied it by 2. So, K prime, this new equilibrium constant, is equal to the old equilibrium constant, K, squared. All you did was square this, and what you get is you square this, you square this, this is what you get, right? So, if you multiply the coefficients, whatever the coefficients, you multiply the coefficients by whatever number you wish, if you multiply it by 2, this would be squared. If <coughs> instead of 2, I multiply this by, I multiply this by 1 half, right? If I multiply this by 1 half, this becomes NO2, and this becomes N, um, um, 1 half N2O4, right? So now the equilibrium constant expression is going to be, the equilibrium constant expression is going to be N2O4 to the power half, right? divided by the NO2 concentration. So how are the two related? This is exactly equal to the square root of this. So K prime is equal to KC, the original equilibrium constant, that one, times taken to the power half, the square root of it, okay? So manipulation by a number, if you manipulate it by a number, it doesn't change anything. All you do, well, it changes it, but it's just simply, Whatever the number is that you multiply it, it's just going to be, uh, you take the uh, appropriate exponent. If you multiply it by 2, this would be squared. If you multiply it by 1 half, it would be to the power 1 half, okay? So it's as simple as that. The other thing I want to discuss is what happens, these are just simple ideas, very simple ideas. There's nothing very difficult about it, okay? There's nothing very... Uh, uh, all you have to do is be very systematic in terms of approaching it. So let's say I have A plus B going to C, and I have an equilibrium constant, whatever the value is, A is equal to something, okay? Now I take this compound C, and I react it with D to give me a product P, and the equilibrium constant for this reaction is equal to something, right? Now if I add these two reactions up, if I add, so I'll call this one, Reaction 1, and this is reaction 2, I'll call this K1, and this I'll call K2, okay? So if I add the two reactions up, algebraically add the two reactions up, what am I going to get? C and C is going to cancel. One is on the product, one is on the reactant side. And what I get in this case is A plus B plus D goes to P, right? What's the value of the new equilibrium constant? The value of the new equilibrium constant is simply equal to K1 times K2. So if you add two reactions together, then you multiply the equilibrium constants. If you add two reactions together, you just simply multiply the equilibrium constants. And you can verify this, okay? You can verify this very easily that that's the case, okay? How would you verify it? K1 in this case is equal to the concentration of C divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of B, right? In this case, K2 is equal to the concentration of P divided by the concentration of C times the concentration of D, right? If I multiply the two together, K1 times K2 is equal to C divided by A, parentheses around each one of them, times P divided by the concentration of C times the concentration of D, right? The C and C cancels, and what you're left with is the concentration of P divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of D times the concentration of D. And that's exactly what you have here. If you take the value of K, this would be the concentration of the products divided by A times B times D, which is exactly the same as there, okay? So if you're adding two reactions together, this is the moral of the story. This is the, uh, the, the key thing here. If you're adding two reactions together, 
All you have to do is multiply the corresponding equilibrium constants, and that will give you the equilibrium constant of the new reaction that you've added, that you've obtained by adding. If you subtracted it, if you subtract two from one, then you would divide the equilibrium constants. That's all it is, okay? You would divide the equilibrium constants. So, uh, there are a few exercises that I just want to go over here, and that's in chapter, I mean, slide 13 of, of your part two slides, okay? Slide 13 of your part two slides. So, let's look at that. So, in this case, you have the same thing. You have N2O4 gas, N2O4 gas, giving you 2NO2 gas, giving you 2NO2 gas, okay? And the value of this equilibrium constant is given to you as Kc is equal to 4.63 times 10 to the power minus 3, okay? Minus 3. What you're asked to do is, now, two things you're asked to determine. You're asked to determine the equilibrium constant for the following reaction, 2NO2 gas going to N2O4 gas. N2O4 gas. And the second one is NO gas B. The second one you're asked to determine is for NO2 gas going to one half N two O four. So, señores, señoras, y señoritas, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to tell me what's the equilibrium constant of this one. What's the equilibrium constant of the first one? The only difference between this is as I've multiplied this by 2, right? And I've reversed it, correct? I multiplied this by 2 and I've reversed it, right? So the first thing you want to do is what? Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. Oh, bad mistake, I'm sorry. Well, the only difference between this and this is what? Right? I've just reversed it, right? So in this case, the equilibrium constant of this reaction is going to be 1 over 4.63 times 10 to the power minus 3, right? Um, somebody sent me an email. Okay, not anything to do with this class. Okay, let me go back here. Okay. So 4.63 times 10 to the power minus 3. So the equilibrium constant of this one is, the, is just... Because this is just the reverse reaction, right? So tell me what the value of this is. 104.63 times 10 to the power minus 3. It will be about uh, 2 times 10 to the power minus 2 or so, right? No? Something like that? I don't know. 2.2. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you work that out, okay? Well, I got 215.98. I don't know if it's right. I'm, so, I'm sorry, what did you get? 215. Oh, I have a hard time hearing. I don't know why. Um, maybe you can just send me a chat message, then that way I'll know what the value is. Although, you know, you don't need to do that. But the answer, the, the next slide on this gives you the answer. Okay. <laughs> so, really, uh, the next slide in the answer gives you what the value uh, Slide number 15 tells you what the answer is. Okay. Yes, I think 216. Yes, that's what, okay. 216. Okay. Is that what you said? I think that's what you said. I'm sorry, as I get older, my, my hearing is uh, uh, too much loud rock and roll. No, uh, too much loud something. Okay. So, now, what's the difference between reaction A and reaction B? What's the difference between reaction A and reaction B? The only difference between reaction A and reaction B is what? Is that you have divided this by 2, right? You have divided this by 2 to go from here to here. So the value of the equilibrium constant would be 216 
to the power half. So the square root of 216, which comes out to be equal to 14.7. So you need to be able to do uh, problems like these, where you're just manipulating. Okay, number one is the first thing is the manipulation between KC and KP. You need to manipulate the reactions to be able to get uh, both KC and KP in terms of pressure units and, uh, and vice versa. Remember, KP is equal to KC times RT to the power delta N. Things that people make mistakes on are this. T must be in Kelvin, okay? The T that you use in that unit, in that equation, must be in degrees Kelvin. That's what's important, okay? That's what's important. Um, okay. Let me go on to some other things uh, before I... <laughs> So all the while here, what have we talked about? We talked about equilibrium constants. So the understanding is very simple. The understanding is that we are at equilibrium, right? The understanding is, implicit understanding is that when you calculate an equilibrium constant and you write down the expression for the equilibrium constants, these are all at concentrations that are calculated at equilibrium. What does that mean? That means that if you are looking at this reaction, right? If you are looking at this reaction, okay? If you are looking at this reaction, you are looking at the reaction and you're saying that this is the equilibrium condition when the concentrations of them do not change as a function of time, right? That's the implicit assumption. Now, let's say we make things a little more interesting, okay? Let's say that we make things a little more interesting. So, I'm going to, let me leave this here. Let me leave this here for the moment, okay? But sometimes you might not be at equilibrium. Sometimes you might not be at equilibrium. What that means is, so let's say that in this case, I start, this is what I do. I have a reaction vessel, okay? So this is my reaction vessel in which I have the concentrations of N2O4 and NO2, right? And I just put in arbitrary amounts. Let's say that in this case, I put five moles of N2O4, five molar into NO2, and I put two molar, uh, um, five molar of the NO2, and I put uh, 0.1 molar of N2O4. I start with that, okay? That's my starting at this point, right? Now, what I want to know is, has the system attained equilibrium at this point? So when I make this reaction, when I put these two together, has the system attained equilibrium? Well, the way I can do it is by using an expression that is very similar to the equilibrium constant, which is called the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient does exactly the same thing as the equilibrium constant meaning it's the same expression as the equilibrium constant, except that the concentrations that you're using are not in equilibrium. So in this case, you have NO2 squared divided by N2O4. But this is not at equilibrium. It could be anywhere in this part. So in this case, I, have, I can take NO2 squared as 5 times squared as 25, and divide it by 0.1, and what I'm going to get is the value of the equilibrium, uh, the value of Q, the value of Q is, um, the, 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 the value of Q is what? The value of Q is 25 divided by 0.1 is what? Is 2.5, right? No, 250, I'm sorry, 25. 250. 250, thank you. I told you, I'm getting old. I can I can do simple math, okay? 25 divided by 0.1 is 250, right? So what does that tell you? It tells you that the reaction quotient now is 250. So you want to use this reaction coefficient to predict in which direction the reaction would go, right? So in this case, 
the value of the equivalent constant is given to you 4.63 times 10 to the power minus 3, correct? So let's write this out as 0 0.00463, right? So this reaction quotient Q is much, much larger than the value of K, 250 is definitely several orders of magnitude larger than 0 0.00463, right? So since Q is larger than K, I can predict in which direction the equilibrium is going to go. Since, remember, in all cases, the system is going to try and attain equilibrium. And the only way it can attain equilibrium in this case is by going in the reverse direction such that this concentration is going to be less. And by reducing this concentration, the value of Q now can become very close, can become equal to K. But at this point in time, the value of Q is much, much greater than K. And so the reaction is going to go in this direction. So if the value of Q is much, much greater than K, the reaction is going to go in the reverse direction. If Q is equal to K, the reaction is at equilibrium. If Q is less than K, then what's going to happen is that the reaction is going to go in the forward direction. So these are the, this gives you an idea of how the reaction is going to go when you mix two substances together. When you mix the substances together, you just calculate the value of Q is, and if Q is in a certain, at a certain value that is either less than K or greater than K, that will tell you in which direction the reaction will go, okay? So it tells you the value of K, and I show that in, in uh, slide 17, it tells you the value of K indicates how the reaction will proceed, okay? It indicates how the reaction will proceed in this case, okay? So an example of that is given to you in, in, uh, in slide 18, when you take the reaction H2O gas plus CO gas gives you H2 plus CO2 gas. And what you see is, what are the regions when Q is less than K, when Q is equal to K, and when Q is greater than K. So in this region now, Q is less than K. The equilibrium constant is much higher than the value of the reaction quotient. Q is just what is called the reaction quotient. It's exactly the same algebraic expression as the equilibrium constant, okay? But it's not the same thing. In other words, this is at this point, this is the equilibrium constant is calculated when the system is at equilibrium, okay? That's the difference between Q and K. <clears throat> so, let's look at problem number, uh, slide number 19. Slide number 19 is an actual problem. In slide number 19, what you want to do is, so let me erase this, okay? In slide number 19, what you have is an actual problem. And that problem in this case is you have CH4 plus H2O gives you CO plus 3H2, CO plus 3H2, okay? CO plus 3H2. So in this case now, in this case, you are given the concentrations 0.1 molar, right? 0.2 molar for H2O. The CO concentration is 0 0.500 molar and 0 0.800 molar. So remember, in this case, you're mixing all of these concentrations together, right? You don't know in which direction the reaction is going to go. What you have to do is calculate Q. By the way, you've given the value of K in this case. The value of KC is equal to 5.6. What you will have to do is you're asked to determine in which direction the reaction will proceed. So what you have to do is using these concentrations, calculate what the value of the reaction quotient is going to be. So the expression for the reaction quotient is exactly the same as KC, as how you would do it for KC. So it's going to be 
the concentration of CO, which is 0.5, right? The concentration of H2 is uh, 3 moles of H2, so this would be 0.8 times to the power 3, right? Divided by the concentration of CH4, which is 0.1, times the concentration of H2O, which is 0.2. So you have to calculate what the value of Q is going to be. You have to calculate what the value of Q is going to be. And when you calculate the value of Q, what you will see is that the value of Q is going to be equal to 12.8. Right? Value of Q, you can verify this when you uh, multiply it all together and divide it by uh, 0 0.02, which you will get is 12.8. And in this case, Q now is much larger than K. Q is much larger than K. Correct? Q is 12.8. The value of K is 5.6. So how is the system going to attain equilibrium? It's going to go in the reverse direction. That is, it has to reduce the number of products, reduce the amount of the products, and increase the amount of the reactants such that this value of 12.8 will go down to 5.6. So the reaction will attain equilibrium by adjusting it such that it goes to the left, by adjusting it such that it goes to the left, okay? So there are some other rules about equilibrium constant expressions that I want to cover here as well. Um, and that has to do with the state of matter. That has to do with the state of matter. That is whether it's a solid, whether it's a liquid or a gas. Okay. So let's take a particular reaction in this case. And the particular reaction that I want to look at is the decomposition of calcium carbonate solid. Okay. You can take CaCO3 solid and you can decompose it and what you will get is CaO solid plus CO2 gas. By convention, I mean if you were writing this down, if you were writing this down, the equilibrium constant expression would be CaO concentration times the concentration of CO2 gas divided by the concentration of CaCO3. But these are solids. Literally, what you're doing in this experiment is you're taking solid calcium carbonate, okay? Chalk, correct? Chalk is a good example of, of calcium carbonate. You're taking chalk or marble, for example, and you're decomposing it to give you CaO plus CO2. The calcium carbonate in this case is a solid. There's no concentration unit associated with the solid, okay? It's just a pure solid. So, by definition, solids do not enter into an equilibrium constant expression. So, in this case, we just ignore anything which is in the solid state, and we only use anything that is in liquid or in a, uh, anything that is an aqueous solution. Okay? Anything that is a gas or an aqueous solution. So, in this case, the Kc is simply equal to the CO2 concentration. That's all it is. There's nothing else involved in this, okay? There's nothing else that is involved in this. So the equilibrium constant expression, solids do not appear in the equilibrium constant expression. And you need to remember this, okay? Solids do not enter into the equilibrium constant expression. Similarly, pure liquids also, pure liquids. So if the designation is pure liquid also, it does not enter into the expression. So, for example, if you have an acid and you dissolve this and you have you have dissolved this in water H2O and this gives you dissociates to give you H plus plus A minus and this is aqueous and this is aqueous and the reason I'm putting this equation down is because I'm giving you a gentle nudge into chapter 15, right? So, in this case, if I wanted to write down the equilibrium constant expression, this is H plus concentration times the concentration of the A minus divided by the concentration of the HA. Okay, this is also aqueous, I'm sorry. Okay, 
and the H2O liquid does not enter into the expression. So pure solids and pure liquids do not enter into an equilibrium constant expression. Okay? And it's important to remember that. It's important to remember to... Uh, it makes your life much easier, okay? It makes your life much, much easier in terms of being able to calculate what goes on, in terms of being able to determine what goes on. So with that, I'm done with, slide, with part two. And what I want to do is begin part three so that um, part three is the toughest part, okay? Part three is the toughest part of this, uh, of this uh, chapter, okay? Uh, and let me get there for a second. I forgot, yes, chapter 14, part three, I didn't open it, so. Okay. So chapter 14, part three. And you know, uh, chapter 14, the first few slides, uh, the first few slides is Le Chatelier's principle, okay? And catalysts and equilibrium systems, okay? S slides from slides nine through 10, from slides nine through whatever the rest of it is, is about, uh, slides. It's about 20 slides. No, it's about 30. 15 slides after slide 9. It ends from slide 1 to slide 23. The meat of the chapter is slides 9 through 23. The first part is, is uh, slide 9 as Le Chatelier's principle, which I'm finished today. And, uh, and I'm not, at a level I don't really particularly care of for. Um, uh, the Chatelier's principle, I'm not, you know, there's nothing much to it, okay? N2 plus 3H2 gives you 2NH3, okay? And again, I need to be careful here. Let's write down the, what the reactants are. N2 plus gas plus 3H2 gas giving you 2NH3 gas. 2NH3, yes. So what is Le Chatelier's principle? So that's what we're going to do right now. Le Chatelier's principle. You know, Le Chatelier's principle is very simple. Le Chatelier's principle says that if a system is at equilibrium and you apply a stress to that equilibrium, then the system is going to act in such a way that it will relieve that stress. Okay? So in other words, if you are stressed out by chapter 14, right, you are at equilibrium, but chapter 14 is stressing you out, what do you do? You go to your wherever you are and you scream loud okay and you can curse me too if you wish okay that's a convenient way to relieve the stress in whatever language you wish you can curse me right and that way you've relieved the stress you come back to equilibrium and not learn anything chapter 14 but anyway you have relieved your stress and you've got back to the equilibrium condition right you can go back to bed for example right so the same thing is true here. So let's say that in this reaction, I have a certain equilibrium constant. I don't know what the equilibrium constant is. But the equilibrium constant here is going to be, I can write down the expression as NH3 squared divided by N2 times H2 cubed, right? So these are all expressions, uh, these are all concentrations that are calculated when the system is in equilibrium. Now, let's suppose that I have the conditions at equilibrium, and to this equilibrium condition, I just dump a whole lot of ammonia into this reaction. I just dump a whole lot of ammonia, NH3, into the reaction vessel. The system has attained equilibrium before I do that, and now I add a huge bunch of ammonia to it. Well, what's going to happen? Number one, Q will start going down and the only way that the system is going to go the system is going to re-attain it so what you've done is i'm sorry q will go up because you've added a huge amount of product and when you've added a huge amount of product the value of q now will increase and the only way that the system can relieve that stress that you have caused the system is by going in the reverse direction so the system is going to relieve that stress by going in this direction. Now, 
if I add a lot more of these two, suppose I add a lot of nitrogen or hydrogen in this case, what's going to happen? The system is going to relieve that stress. So in this case, what I have done is I've added reactants, right? The only way it can relieve the stress is by going in the forward direction, right? To be able to reduce the stress in this case. To be able to reduce the stress and be able to reattain equilibrium because Q now is going to be much, much less than K. And so the same ideas that we use when we're calculating Q. Q now, if you increase these two quantities, Q is going to be much, much less than K. And to get back to K, how can it do? It has to reduce, it has to in, uh, reduce this amount and increase the amount of ammonia. Okay? So it's just what, what I call intuitive. That is, when you stress the system, there's only one way for the system to relieve the stress, and that one way for the system is what you want to look at. Now, there are some other reactions that I want you to look at. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. one second, one second, one second. Let me, let me, let me. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we'll go back to something that we learned in Chem 1100. What did we learn in Chem 1100? Well, so I, I don't know why I erased that. N2 plus 3H2, I'm sorry. Uh, N2 gas, why did I erase? N2 gas plus 3H2 gas gives you 2NH3. Right? And I should have remembered what the equilibrium constant for this reaction was, but I forgot. Okay? Maybe I had it written down somewhere what the equilibrium constant for this reaction is. Yes, it's 1.45 times 10 to the power minus 5. Kp is equal to, Kp is equal to 1.45 times 10 to the power minus 5. Okay? That's what the value of Kp is, okay? Okay, gentlemen, ladies. So what happens now? A very simple question. What happens if I increase, if I decrease the volume in which I carry out this reaction? So here I have all the reactants in this vessel, right? The volume of this vessel is fixed, uh, the volume of the vessel, whatever it may be. I have the nitrogen, the hydrogen, and the ammonia. And now what I'm going to do is compress this reaction vessel, okay? So now I'm going to go to a reaction vessel that is much smaller, say about one-tenth the value of that. One-tenth the value of that initial volume. What is the effect going to be? Think about it. I just want you to think about what's going to happen. So, when you reduce the volume, what is the consequence of reducing the volume? Go back to your gas laws. What happens when you reduce the volume? What happens when you reduce the volume? The pressure goes up. The pressure goes up, that's right. The pressure goes up, right? So, think about this. In this reaction, you have four moles of gas on the left, producing two moles of gas on the right, right? So, in this reaction, as a normal sequence of events, is that the pressure is going to decrease. Why? Because the number of gas moles are decreasing from 4 to 2. So, as a consequence of this, the pressure is also going to go down. Now, by changing the volume, by reducing the volume by 110, right? What are you doing? You're increasing the pressure, right? So, when you increase the pressure in this fashion, the system wants to reattain equilibrium. What is the easiest way for it to attain equilibrium? Is to go in the forward direction. Because if it goes in the forward direction, the number of gas moles becomes less, and therefore the pressure is also going to become less. So it's a convenient way then for it to, not a convenient way, 
It's, an, it's the only way for it to relieve the stress that you have caused on the system when you have increased the pressure on the system. When you've increased the pressure on the system, what it's going to do is go in the forward direction and thereby reduce the number of gas balls that you have. That's what is going to happen. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop and then I'll come back to this on Thursday and uh, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about this and I'll begin that last part of chapter uh, chapter 14, which is everything that you will need for the rest of this course. Everything that you need for the rest of this course will be what we begin on on uh, Thursday. Okay. So, any questions? So remember what I said, I said at the start that the final exam will be online, okay? So for those of you, I think there was somebody who sent me an email, I will put an announcement on that on whiteboard on the, I'm sorry, on blackboard as well, okay? So. Okay, senores, senores, I shall see you for recitation today at, uh, afternoon at one o'clock, okay?